Good after Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is Dana Harganani, Chief Medical Officer with the Oregon Health Authority, and uh, we are welcoming you to another uh, COVID-19 webinar series for healthcare providers webinar today. It is our first one of 2021, and I'm uh, happy to be joined here today by several uh, colleagues. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Mountner, Dr. Smits, who's trying to uh, get on with us here, and Dr. Kopka, and we're really thrilled to uh, share, um, once again, lots of forthcoming information related to the COVID pandemic. Uh, so to get started, I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Mountner to walk through uh, our update. Update. Actually, first, I think if you can um, advance uh, Brent for us, I have one more. Oh, there we go, agenda. So we'll start with an epi update as usual. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some foc uh, focus information on vaccines, which I know is top of mind for so many of you. Um, we have other areas of updated OHA guidance, for example, focus on uh, school reopening, testing and others, and then some literature review. So with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Mountner to uh, start us off on the EPI update. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you know, we witnessed uh, an important spike around the holidays, but we are seeing it. Uh, we are seeing it flatten out as of January 13th. We had had 129,000 total cases, of which 7,000 just over were hospitalized, and unfortunately, 1,708 deaths. As you can see, that uh, that plateau is, although it has come up a little bit, it seems to be holding decently well through the holidays. We can hope that folks continue to observe the precautions. Next slide, please. For the week of January 4 through 10, uh, 8,150 new cases were recorded, up 3% uh, over the prior week, but the number of hospitalizations appears to be staying fairly stable, so that's that's better news. And unfortunately, 107 Oregonians died in association with COVID-19, including, unfortunately, our youngest Oregonian who recently succumbed at the age of 19. The, uh, the test results positivity is running around 8%, and that seems to be pretty stable uh, from prior weeks. Next slide, please. Sorry, the demographics of our cases continue to reflect the disproportionately impacted communities of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, as well as the tribal affiliated, tribally affiliated cases. Uh, and we do see a disproportionate number of hospitalized as well. We are doing very specific targeted outreach with culturally responsive um, methods to try to address those. We know we're not there yet. We're going to continue working on that. Uh, next slide, please. And with regard to ethnicity, as you know, the Latino, Latina, Latinx community is pretty highly impacted, which you can see here. Um, even though the percent of total cases is 27 percent, much higher than the than the representative population, which is 12 or 13 percent, the, the percent hospitalized is is just over 4 percent. So that particular community is um, is not overwhelmingly representative in our hospitalized group. Next slide, please. As you know, we are experiencing extreme levels of risk across the state. There are a few in the lower risk and the high risk level, but we are continuing to have to maintain high levels of precautions given the extreme levels of risk represented across the state, particularly in the population centers. Next slide, please. As we were hoping to see, the hospitalization census has trended down for the most part and has been plateauing from that 
spike that got us so close to overwhelm there in November. And so what we are seeing from this is that Oregonians by and large did observe the precautions and the shot over the bow that was represented by that spike. Uh, and so during the holidays really maintained a lot of the precautions. And I wanna express our gratitude for providers in the community and for communities who really made those hard choices to uh, stay home, stay masked, and uh, maintain physical distancing to to bring that down and not overwhelm our hospital capacity. Dana, I don't know if you wanted to speak more specifically to the hospitalization question. Uh, thank you. Um, I just, uh, I think everything that you outlined, we um, continue to monitor this closely. There continues to be some targeted capacity uh, challenges in certain areas, but broadly speaking, uh, thanks to all the hard work that you um, have done and other Oregonians, uh, we are seeing this improvement here in this trend, which is um, really helpful. On the next slide, you can see how that trend looks for um, our different regions across the state. Uh, so that top trend line is region one, which includes the metro uh, area and beyond and has the most kind of hospital beds and of course population center um, <clears throat> uh, in our state. And you can see that downward trend um, is really helping to drive that statewide trend. In some other areas, we're seeing uh, not as significant drops, uh, but certainly overall uh, some at least uh, steady uh, steadiness or slight improvement, um, if not uh, further improvements. Um, we continue to meet regularly with our hospitals statewide to assess any challenges they're having, and we of course keep a close eye on this data um, uh, as as we move forward through this pandemic. I think. Uh, at the next slide, we are going to uh, stop uh, or move on from our EPI update to start uh, talking a little bit more about um, our COVID vaccine, which I know is um, of uh, a focus of uh, uh, interest. So uh, with the next slide, um, so this uh, is part of our new, newish now vaccination uh, dashboard. Uh, so I will just uh, help walk through what to look at here. This is looking at Oregon's vaccination trend, specifically looking at the doses administered by day in Oregon. And as you can see here, we're just not even uh, four weeks fully into uh, the, the, the work uh, here of uh, disseminating and administering vaccine in Oregon and have certainly learned a lot through this uh, first week's effort. Um, you can see the first date of vaccinations in Oregon was on December 16th. Um, you can note uh, that this first effort and stage included uh, our Christmas holiday and uh, New Year's holiday, uh, whereby you can see that there were quite a few limits in dosage administration during those holiday times and have um, certainly uh, impacted our kind of first efforts. Um, and as you can see, a couple things over time, we've been able to uh, generally trend upwards in our vaccines administered as we uh, further some of the um, operations and manage some of the barriers we've been facing. Um, on the right hand side, you can see uh, that the total doses administered as of yesterday um, were 129,781. Um, you uh, can see below you recognizing that each of the vaccines currently being administered in Oregon include Pfizer and Moderna, and both of those require a, a second uh, dose uh, um, as per the recommendation from FDA at this time. And so um, you can see that there have been a total of uh, nearly 9,500 or closing in on 10,000 uh, individuals who've had both doses now. And the others in the blue above are those who have a series in progress. Um, one note, and I'll speak to that in a, a few minutes, um, some of this certainly information is as of yesterday, but we, were, uh, we do know that there is a um, data lag because this data is as reported through alert and there can be several days uh, at least if not longer of data lag entering into um, our system and so these doses uh, continue to be an evolution in terms of capturing them in our systems. Next slide please. 
Uh, this is also one of our data dashboards. Uh, we have others uh, in evolution, um, but uh, again, you can see those doses administered uh, by day at the um, and the bottom and what I think is different about this dashboard is being able to see uh, the rate of vaccination by population across each of Oregon's counties. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we we keep an eye on this uh, both to understand where each county is uh, and uh, and uh, thinking through helping us to understand in terms of our allocation efforts and the operational challenges that each region might be having in terms of uh, getting uh, doses out. Um, next slide, please. We are also able to share now uh, some of the demographics of vaccinations, uh, of people who have received vaccination. I will share that this is not real D data. We are limited at this moment uh, due to our alert system and the data that we uh, have structured to be captured in there, uh, but it does provide some lens into this information. Um, I'm not going to go into this uh, in detail at this time. Um, I, uh, you know, noteworthy right now that uh, a lot of the, the doses have been administered in probably that workforce age and we'll see emerging here. Uh, with our ongoing uh, partnerships to extend vaccine to some of our long-term care facilities uh, and populations, we'll see those numbers grow in the um, older age as well as with regards to the news the governor announced earlier this week, which we'll talk about uh, here in just a moment. Next slide, please. Um, this is to just alert you. Uh, I, I think, I hope that uh, the CDC actually updates this soon. The CDC is doing uh, this data dashboard at a national level. Um, I suspect that they'll be adding on uh, new rates kind of on this uh, color coding as uh, I think fairly quickly here the state, the states have gone beyond uh, the far right or the dark blue shade. Uh, um, but this has been, um, uh, I think, of interest uh, to both Oregonians and everyone nationally and media just to monitor how states are faring across the country in terms of their um, efforts. Um, so just uh, just noting here uh, to, to keep an eye on this and we'll bring it forward, expect that this will become a little more granular to help uh, display some of the differences and shared experiences that different states are um, having at this time. Next slide, please. So uh, I am sure that most of our listeners have been paying attention to the news from this week, um, and I'll highlight a couple of the bullets here. Um, Governor Brown just a few days ago announced that starting January 23rd, vaccination will be expanded to include um, several other groups. So including seniors 65 and older, uh, child care providers, early learning, and K-12 educators and staff will be able to begin, uh, will be really in that expanded group as of January 23rd, um, in addition to the those eligible already in 1A. Um, <clears throat> the federal government also, uh, you know, right at that same day had announced it will be releasing its full reserve of vaccines available to states rather than holding some in reserve. Um, we are still waiting to, to really clarify what number of doses we might be expecting uh, in the next several weeks based on that release and are still working with our federal colleagues to try to understand uh, better detail about that. Um, I'll mention soon though, uh, we still do not expect that these number of doses to be released will um, be adequate to serve the full population we've just uh, outlined in the uh, in the announcement by Governor Brown. So um, more to come on that. In addition, and I think very importantly, uh, the federal government also announced that the allocations to states will change in terms of what data they're using to inform what doses go to each state. Previously, it had really been based on the relative population size of each state. And now they're moving to uh, considering the amount of doses administered in that state. Therefore, Oregon really, really we're being pushed to uh, demonstrate high utilization, utilization of the doses uh, received. Um, we will certainly continue phase 1A vaccinations uh, through this next week and into the next phase for those who have not uh, received vaccines uh, from those who are eligible. And we're particularly um, focused on those who are particularly most vulnerable, uh, you know, whether that be age or in the in the congregate care setting that they're in, or those who've been disproportionately impacted from COVID-19 and the access points um, not uh, meeting their needs. So these are some of the areas of focus ahead. 
Next slide. Um, a little bit more uh, <laughs> national vaccination data here. Um, I won't spend too much time. This is also from the CDC's website. Uh, this goes alongside with that map and you can just get a better sense. So um, uh, people are paying a lot of attention to the doses that have been distributed to states and the relative number that have been actually administered, uh, knowing that there's a lot of operational detail between those two. Um, some of those doses are also the second doses, and so there is a um, specific required uh, pause and specific timeline by which those second doses are to be administered, and so some of that is uh, not represented in this data here, because, since this is about first doses, but certainly in our overall dose uh, uh, data that we're sharing at OHA. Uh, the bottom part of the slide is related to those doses that have been allocated to the Federal Pharmacy Partnership uh, dedicated for a certain long-term uh, care and other congregate care facilities. Um, next slide, please. Um, as we as uh, we've spoken to in several media veils and, and in other forums, um, we have you know really understood and, and learned just over these last several weeks about the differences in um, both large distribution and administration of the COVID-19 vaccines and how they differ from the uh, traditional um, processes we use for things like influenza and other uh, vaccines. Um, some of these uh, you've probably heard before, the cold storage needs, uh, particularly for Pfizer vaccine, which is one of the you know, two main dose, uh, vaccines and doses we're getting right now um, are challenging. Um, there are minimum dosages for shipments. Uh, that's almost a thousand at Pfizer. So splitting those up when you think about it, uh, just in terms of the minimal uh, shipments as well as the cold storage challenges um, is quite, uh, quite significant. And even for, for uh, smaller sites, uh, a minimal shipment of 100 doses of Moderna is hard, especially as we are being pushed to ensure strong uptake and utilization. So those are factors that we're dealing with. Um, we as a state do not receive any vaccine directly um, as a state agency or a government. Um, what we are in charge of is uh, making decisions um, about allocation, where doses that are, are identified for our state, where they should be shipped to. Um, and so we, uh, there's a lot of complexity to making those uh, decisions and thinking through um, a lot of variables. And there's also uh, been a variety of unknowns with regards to what exact allocations are forthcoming uh, in the future uh, from the federal government. So these are all things that we have to uh, pay particular attention to. Um, and as I alluded to before, um, even with this announcement of releasing those vaccines in reserve, we know that there are still going to be inadequate doses coming in these couple of weeks um, relative to the size of the population who would be eligible. And so we're really going to be strongly messaging um, around patients and really ensuring our operations are in order for access points. Um, but it, even though someone may be eligible, it may take a uh, weeks or longer uh, for that vaccine access, and it's limited in part by the allocation from the federal government and how quickly doses flow. Certainly also with regards to any other future vaccines that may become available um, in the not too distant future. Um, <clears throat> just in terms of administering vaccines and the throughput, um, there are a variety of things that are different once again from other vaccines that we're used to uh, administering, um, scheduling, um, is uh, different in thinking about the actual, thinking differently about who's eligible and who's not and, uh, and trying to set up the scheduling to support that. Um, understanding the space requirements as we're still uh, in the middle of a pandemic and ensuring physical distancing when people um, are coming through lines for vaccine, uh, need to have an observation period and so forth. Um, so space has definitely become an issue and really managing the flow of individuals receiving vaccines has, has been a strong focus. Um, we um, limited outlets to give vaccine. Um, I will get to in a little bit more in just a moment, but we certainly know that again, the Pfizer vaccine is a particular challenge. Um, the movement of vaccine is different than it is with other vaccines. Um, so all of all of this is um, uh, having impact to how we're uh, conceptualizing, at least in this uh, forefront of this distribution process, where we're trying to get vaccine to. Um, provider enrollment, just a quick note here, you know, we have hundreds of people normally enrolled uh, to provide vaccines in our state, but that had to start really 
new with COVID vaccine. We required we were required to do COVID vaccine specific provider enrollment, um, and that was um, fairly late breaking information. And so there's been a strong effort. Uh, it took a bit getting going, and we have brought in more resource to, to keep that moving forward so that we have a broader network of providers enrolled as we are able to start distributing doses more broadly. Um, although we there are many other factors to inform when we're able to do that. Um, and I already mentioned the data lab. So right now we're certainly it's important for us to consider how the movement of vaccine is uh, flowing from when it's received to when it's administered and their data lag uh, is really been a significant challenge for us to really understand what doses are getting in arms um, every day. Next slide. Um, I <coughs> We've shared this in other venues, but just want to take a moment here. So far, we've been focusing our vaccine distribution, really thinking about the 1A population and all of the operational challenges that I've outlined before. So we've had vaccines going to hospitals and tribal uh, health entities. We've been uh, distributing some doses to our local public health authorities or local public health uh, at the county level. Um, EMS providers and first responders were included uh, in 1A in the first uh, in the first group originally, and so we have some large EMS providers uh, that have received vaccination uh, that were able to vaccinate uh, large numbers of their employees and or also other first responders in their communities. Um, we've had urgent care centers receive vaccines, uh, noting where they were originally on our uh, sequencing plan. And our federal pharmacy partnership is uh, managed at the federal level, although we are really focused on coordinating with uh, with these entities. These are three pharmacies who are working uh, to uh, to receive supply of vaccine and then uh, doing end to end vaccination for initially skilled nursing facilities, um, including residents and staff. Uh, that was part of Part A and still uh, finishing up. And we've also uh, moved forward into Part B, which includes a variety of other long term care facilities and congregate care settings. There's been um, a lot of uh, challenges in getting clear information about who all is included, and there's been some changes as this Part B has moved forward, and so we're making sure we understand who is not going to be receiving vaccines so we can find alternative state mechanisms to provide vaccines to this very important population. Um, and again, all of this, uh, we're looking ahead to what, uh, what we need to do to ensure strong throughput in vaccination, particularly as we get to a larger eligible populations um, starting January 23rd. Uh, next slide. Um, and I know I will just note there are, I know there's questions. I think there's just a few more slides here and then we will make sure to pause and take a look at some of the vaccine questions as we know this is a particularly high on everybody's mind. Given all the um, learnings we've had over these last couple of weeks um, and uh, the, the challenges operationally and with the allotments and having to uh, de develop allocations and the, the really strong focus on throughput, um, right now we're really depending on more centralized regional vaccine access points. Um, this looks a bit different in every community and truly has been a fully or uh, more fully um, uh, being organized even just over these last couple of weeks. So I know that people have been frustrated who are eligible in way may not to know where uh, to get vaccines. And um, I know there's a lot of emergence of more information and we are standing up a website information thereby you would know where those regional vaccine access uh, points are. And I believe we're hoping to get that up by the end of this week, uh, but certainly very urgently. So in the centralized approach, rather than kind of uh, disparate, you know, across many medical offices, which is, of course, our normal approach to vaccine. But given all the things I've outlined, we're really at this stage looking at this more centralized access points that might include partners such as certainly a convener and lead uh, organizer around local public health authorities our hospitals and health systems just being able to uh, move large doses of vaccines with their experience thus far and also other regional partners um, that may play, you know, varying uh, level of roles in each community, like our federal qualified health centers, other EMS entities, uh, and beyond. 
I've already mentioned the federal pharmacy uh, program, and we are also working strongly to, to stand up uh, state pharmacy partners that could both provide that mobile access uh, to those long-term care facilities or congregate care facilities, or individuals with, uh, you know, eligible who are not able to be mobile to leave. So we are quickly working to uh, stand up those partnerships and have ongoing uh, meetings and planning and works with several pharmacies in our state as we speak. Ultimately, we are also working towards what might be a more traditional retail access point across pharmacies. Um, there's work underway at the federal level to support that through a federal partnership with uh, uh, pharmacies in our state and we are also looking what we might want to do here that we have you know just um, that we're leading and those are all uh, very actively in the works. Um, it does complicate things and have uh, a lot of implications for thinking through how we manage these allocations but we think are really important resources that we have ready and available as soon as we can put them into place. Next slide. Um, I do want to just share, it. we recognize that there has been um, a lot of frustration and challenges and, and we know that some of the limitations will be ongoing. So I wanted to outline a few of those. We, first of all, as I've said a few times, there just are not enough vaccines for everyone who's eligible. Um, as the operations stand up and things, uh, the access points in each community for eligible individuals become more clear just over these coming days and information flowing uh, to get people to understand where they can meet those access points, there will still be not enough doses to serve everyone. And so that is something we're going to be working through for a weeks or longer. Um, again, we I've outlined a couple of reasons why just uh, standard vaccination distribution um, isn't uh, possible immediately. We are having a team work through uh, thinking about how we uh, get to that point. We know so many of you um, are trusted sources of vaccination for your patients, uh, but there are just many um, complicating factors uh, to be able to uh, lift that up immediately. So we are working through to understand how we can get there and what that timing might look, how, how that um, how that works with some of the limitations on the shipping, uh, the cold chain storage, um, our allocations and the really need to have very high immediate throughput to make sure our state allocations stay high. So these are active areas that we are working on um, and we'll continue to communicate with you. Um, we certainly know that some of those uh, distribution pathways have been initially uh, just more straightforward. Um, hospitals can vaccinate their own employees or affiliated staff they have immediate access to. We've talked about the federal pharmacy partnerships that were set up earlier uh, um, in this, uh, this system, um, but we recognize and know that there's frustration being felt by healthcare personnel who aren't affiliated um, <clears throat> and that we really are working hard to adapt to, to uh, these challenges that we're facing to get there. And I really hope some of the information we'll be able to provide and website access points and that we're working on with each of our communities will be able to help resolve some of these frustrations uh, despite knowing that we will still be uh, limited by vaccine doses. Next slide, please. Um, I will just, I think we've talked about, I've talked about minutes of this already, um, including moving into the Part B Federal Pharmacy Partnership, um, the retail pharmacies that I've already mentioned. Um, we're trying to accelerate these pathways to become quickly available um, in the constraints of our current system. And we have some pretty active work underway to uh, um, make sure more information is available where unaffiliated healthcare personnel can access uh, doses if they haven't yet, um, and ensure some of those that um, may not have been utilizing these pathways or had access are also um, uh, who were included in WNA getting um, access in the, these immediate days and week ahead. So including traditional healthcare interpreters, um, sorry, traditional health workers, healthcare interpreters, and individuals with in, uh, intellectual and developmental disability and other disabilities specifically. Next slide, please. Um, when we always post these slides, um, we hope that you have been able to find our COVID vaccine website. It's pretty uh, uh, um, right in the front of our COVID vaccine, or sorry, our COVID website. Um, there's a variety of other uh, information pages. If you know how to access these slides, you can find these links, but hopefully much of this is um, pretty accessible as you get to OHA's COVID vaccine website. I mean, I think we can move forward. There's just a couple of other updates. I think Dr. Kopka is going to walk us through uh, regarding vaccines, and then we can pause to take some of your questions. Dr. Kopka?
You're on mute, Dr. Kopka, just so you know. Thank you so much. <laughs> thanks so much, Dr. Harganani. I know many of you through the echoes over the last several months, so thanks for hanging on and, and staying with us. Um, I know there's a number of questions in the chat, and so I'm just going to review briefly the new vaccines that are on the horizon, and then we will get to some of your questions uh, before we do the next portion of this. Um, so we have the two mRNA vaccines that are out, which is uh, exciting, and all of those logistics that we just went through uh, are being very actively worked on. I do want to answer very briefly uh, the, a theme of the questions in the chat, which is hospital systems and um, other large systems involvement. And I will just say they are very active partners. Um, large systems have been working really hard and recognize the need to vaccinate non-affiliated healthcare folks. And so we can talk about that in a few minutes. Um, here's an update for the three next vaccines that are on the horizon. I will be very brief. The first one is a Janssen uh, vaccine. It's an adenovirus vaccine, and they are in the last phase of their trial. It is a single dose uh, and requires normal refrigeration, which is uh, great because I think the first wave of vaccines requiring ultra cold storage really presented a logistical hurdle that then um, had some unintended consequences. And so, so many of these next vaccines having normal refrigeration will make that uh, piece. Uh, uh, gone. The AstraZeneca, many of you have heard about uh, that that's on the horizon. It looks like the first week of March maybe when um, we'll have some good data for uh, EUA review. Uh, this is also a two dose and normal refrigeration. The Novavax is a protein subunit vaccine and I know you many of you heard the more detailed update for all of these from Joe Sullivan at the previous uh, echo in December. This one is also a two dose regimen and it looks like late March would be when they apply for EUA. So these are definitely uh, on the horizon very soon. So the two that we have, uh, we definitely are going to need more uh, coming in the near future. Next slide, please. There's also the variants. Uh, viruses mutate, as we all know. M many of you are probably following this carefully and know that there are two variants, one mostly in the UK, the other mostly in South Africa, that uh, seem to be popping up and show uh, an increased transmissibility. Uh, they have not been shown to have increased uh, deadliness or complications. So when people get it, it looks about the same in the population. But because of the increased transmissibility, um, we know that we need to keep uh, good track of this one or these. Um, the mRNA vaccine so far appears to be likely to be effective even uh, for the variants. So that's reassuring. Uh, and we also know, as we've all emphasized over and over, uh, transmission is a really key element. And so even more so here, making sure that we're really adhering to the messaging about masking, distancing, um, and uh, hand washing in the way that we have been all along. Uh, probably even more important, even though the vaccines are the light at the end of the tunnel. Next slide. This is just a map of states where they have already detected the variant. As many of you probably know, we don't do as much surveillance as other countries, particularly the UK, which is um, you know, one of the reasons they were able to detect it so quickly is because they do quite a bit of uh, surveillance on um, mutations. And uh, in, in this country, we now have detected in several states and um, we, assume it's probably already here in others as well and um, we may not be detecting it just yet. Next slide. So you probably, if you know me at all, <laughs> know that I'm an impassioned testing advocate. We all know that, um, next slide please, testing is a really important component of being able to reduce transmission 
And uh, there is a lot of data suggesting that point of care testing is a really important component of doing this testing. The state has Binax Now tests um, available, and if you have not made yourself, have you, if you have not availed yourself of these, there's a link in this particular slide uh, to be able to request some. Uh, this is intended to augment already existing testing capacity. Uh, the idea is being able to have a point of care test so that at the same moment people present for the test, hopefully earlier on in their uh, disease course, being able to immediately identify that they have COVID-19 and giving them the support that they need at that moment, both can uh, allow them to have the information they need to reduce transmission without delay for the next couple of days if they were otherwise going to be waiting for their test results. Um, and it also uh, allows the staff, because we know you all are facing tremendous staffing challenges, it allows the staff to be able to communicate what that patient needs immediately and without having to track them down by phone afterwards, uh, as we know that's a considerable demand on staffing. Next slide. Dr. Kafka, really, yes, really quick before we move forward, I'm going to just answer a couple questions on vaccines before we get too far and then we can keep moving forward. Perfect. Um, I know there's some really other great topics we want to make sure you all hear about, but just a couple uh, things I may not be able to get to all of them. Um, one of the recent questions was uh, what percentage of vaccines allocated for Oregon have been given? Um, and I cannot pull the slide up in front of me, I'm sorry, but one of the dashboard slides that I uh, showed you showed the doses that had been received versus received in Oregon and the doses that had been administered. And uh, I, so I will try to look it up if I can respond into the, um, the chat box, I will do that, but that is a live updated every day uh, um, dashboard. And again, I just want to mention one more time that that uh, that for any given day of vaccinations given, we see that number rise over the following uh, three, four days, or sometimes even beyond because of the data entry lag. Um, so it, it, it both shows you by day and overall uh, on the dashboard. Um, I, uh, I do not know, you know, the doses, again, that we're expected to be quote unquote released from the federal government, so they're no longer keeping our state doses in reserve. We do not yet know how many are forthcoming to our state. Um, a couple other questions that I saw um, about a question about what is the capability of moving vaccine around uh, to make sure it's being optimally utilized, and that has actually uh, definitely been happening already. Uh, people who receive vaccine, there is specific information available on our website and for those vaccinators receiving vaccine uh, that they are allowed to move vaccine around to a location or to another partner who has a need and, and can move those doses uh, more quickly. And that's been happening in Oregon already. That is being tracked through alert as an example. Um, we are not um, able to capture statewide data specifically on vaccine hesitancy. We are also anecdotally hearing differences um, across kind of regionally or geographically across our state um, where perhaps there's some uh, more hesitancy or refusal rates, for example, in Eastern Oregon. We know there have been some level of um, uh, uh, choosing, opting out of vaccine in some of our congregate care settings and that data is uh, um, currently, uh, part of that data is that with the federal government, uh, or sorry, with the pharmacies partnering with the federal government and the state. So we don't have uh, data across uh, across the state or a, a strong denominator, but we we are um, keeping an ear out for that information. And and to that end, we have some very strong public media, uh, paid media, earned media uh, messages coming out in a very short order here. Um, we we're just finishing um, some research that's been done, focus groups. Uh, with a, a diversity of uh, individuals who've been uh, disproportionately impacted by COVID to help shape those messages around vaccine hesitancy, and you should begin to see that in the quite near future. Um, I think, uh, and then the, the last thing that I was going to say, and then I think we can keep moving on and we'll keep trying to address these as we go in the chat box. Um, there, uh, again, I just wanted to say we know um, a lot of the doses are being organized at that kind of centralized regional place across each community. Some of those communities have been 
more able uh, as they realize that that was the operations that are going to be most effective to get doses out for the, the majority of individuals. Um, those have been stood up. Some of those are already accessible for even individual um, unaffiliated providers and in other regions they've been more closed and are getting towards opening and again we're going to be standing out a website to direct you to those local level information about where to get information and each of those entities are managing uh, scheduling registration and getting people in. Uh, so although you might have heard that X hospital or health system um, was not letting everybody in. We know for one example in the metro area, there are some strong efforts ahead and expecting uh, quite large vaccine events that would be open to eligible people with scheduling uh, online. So more information coming just in the coming days. And um, I, I hope everybody is going to feel more access points as we go. So I will pass it back to you, Dr. Kafka. Great, thank you. Hopefully um, many of the questions are being answered as we go, but just to pause and note that if there are, we will review the chat later, and if there are things we have uh, not gotten to, we will make sure we bring it to you at the next session. Um, and then that last point that Dr. Harganani mentioned about uh, large health systems really taking a, a important role for unaffiliated practices and uh, providers and thinking ahead for some of the most vulnerable um, communities in our state that is happening and every day is uh, is improving. So um, just know that that is is happening and there's a number of events already this weekend. Some health systems like Kaiser have opened up to uh, all healthcare providers uh, who are Kaiser members, for example. So just know that those systems are very aware that there is a need for healthcare providers and staff to be vaccinated and are doing their best to make that information and uh, availability as quickly as possible in addition to all the other things that were relayed. So this next topic, just going to bring uh, bring this out here because updated guidance is coming out next week about the Ready School Safe Learners. Uh, and there are many school districts that are gearing up to uh, consider opening. Uh, in the last week, I have made myself much more familiar with the literature than I ever was before, and I have to admit I'm, I'm motivated because I have a fifth grade teacher as a stepmother in Portland Public. My dad's a retired teacher. I have two kids in public school and, um, you know, in, in our patient population, I hear lots of stories of the many, many, many struggles that people are uh, dealing with with schools not being open. and. Um, and the huge impact that's having on families and on kids. And so I think we are all uh, aware that that's happening. And the question is how and what does the data show? Next slide, please. So Governor Brown has made it very clear that that is a um, very important priority moving forward. And um, staying grounded in the evidence yet prioritizing getting kids back into school as soon as feasible and possible is a huge priority. Um, the governor's office is partnering with OHA for COVID-19 testing at schools uh, that is largely through by next now testing. There are health metrics for returning to in-person instruction um, that are now transitioning to advisory recommendations rather than requirements that happened on January 1st. And uh, we are looking at the advisory health metrics for returning to in-person instruction. And that is, as I said, um, going to be reviewed next week. The guidance uh, through the Ready School St Safe Learning and Oregon OSHA rules, the priorities are health and safety procedures and protocols because we know that, the, that everything depends on implementation on the ground. Um, and in-person instruction is ideal if uh, at all feasible. Next slide. The main point uh, being relayed here is that the transition is intended to be moving to local decision making. So local public health and school districts are working together to uh, determine ways to open schools safely and they know how to manage schools on the ground. Um, the OHA and Oregon Department of Education are working together to get as much useful guidance as possible to be able to do so safely. Next slide. 
So this is a lot of information and uh, relays how um, tricky it's been to implement. These are the current metrics for uh, school reopening. And um, you can see the risk levels. And the main thing I wanted to direct your attention to is in that um, right hand column, the the uh, case rate of over 200. That's one of the main things that's changing in the new uh, guidance that there's a recognition that if in the school the um, safety precautions are being adhered to that that the background rates of infection probably can be shifted upwards as long as the uh, attention is paid to keeping transmission in schools um, uh, as carefully regulated as possible. Next slide. So again, here's the simplified proposed metrics and I'll direct your attention all the way to the right at the top again um, from 200 is now increased to 350. Again, these are advisory. So at the local level, they can determine uh, how they would like to implement or uh, when to implement. Um, so there's on-site and hybrid uh, at, the, at the low end and then distance learning is recommended at the high end. Um, there's also been some simplification of some of the other metrics, including the test positivity rates. This is intended to be uh, as clear as possible and um, to make it easier for planning purposes. Next slide. As I mentioned, rapid COVID testing in schools needs to be available, and that is something that we're working on right now. The Buy Next Now test, caps, test kits, not cats, are what are being made available. And the goal is to test all students and staff who develop symptoms promptly. And then um, any of those who are exposed to a case within their cohort is really important. Next slide. Next slide. So I am going to be talking about literature updates. Ariel Smith will be um, doing most of that, but I just wanted to start with this one particular article that was extremely convincing to me and really adds to the literature, which is um, uh, getting to be a very large body of literature that really makes it much more clear that kids who are getting COVID, who are attending in-person school, where schools have adhered very carefully to protocols, particularly with masking, distancing, and hand washing and cohorting, that those schools are not where the kids are getting their COVID. So, um, and this was a just really nicely done study that demonstrates that it's a case control study with almost 900 kids uh, under 18. They took kids uh, who had positive test results at a testing center and kids who had negative test results at a testing center and then compared their exposures. And um, like I said, schools were not where kids were getting the COVID from and particularly schools where it, there was strict adherence to face masking use. Um, the places where they were getting exposures uh, for those who tested positive were those who had close contacts with confirmed COVID, those who attended gatherings and social functions, those who had activities with other children, including after school, um, those who had visitors in the home. Um, and all of those associations were statistically significant. So there is a lot of international literature now that is showing something similar. Next slide. I just threw in a bunch of other references that we're using to review this topic if you have a uh, late night time to do a deep dive. So this is for your enjoyment. Next slide. Over to you, Dr. Smith. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I know you're all really interested in um, the vaccines and that's probably where a lot of your brains are and I think that's where my brain has been a lot lately. But I wanted to just highlight one article um, among several that have come out recently just to kind of bring back to your um, your attention sort of um, ongoing problems with drug overdose. So um, 
the CDC just published a um, study looking at drug overdose deaths in the United States. Um, you can find this on their website. Uh, and 81,000 uh, fatal drug overdoses occurred in the United States in the last 12 months um, in the year ending May 2020. That's the highest one year total ever. Um, and the largest documented increase was March to May. So that's when people were, um, you know, the stay at home, save lives, those types of things were in place. The main increased driver and in overdose appears to be fentanyl. Um, there was also a, a, a quite a jump in co cocaine overdoses, most of which were actually probably mixed with either fentanyl or, hero or heroin or fentanyl, um, unknown to the to the user. Um, and there was also the biggest increase that they have ever seen in um, psychostimulant, like methamphetamine overdoses. So um, really wanted to just kind of remind everybody that um, while we're all really concerned about COVID, there are other causes of death in our communities and that we really need to remember that and remember about drug overdoses. Next slide. So the CDC recommends um, basically based on what they were when they looked at the data on overdoses that we really need to continue to try to work on expanding our availability and use of naloxone and other overdose prevention um, drugs and education and expanding awareness about the access and availability of treatment for substance use disorders um, intervening intervening as early as possible with individuals at high risk for overdose and improve detection of overdose outbreaks um, so if you um, have patients who uh, you think are using, um, make sure they have a naloxone prescription or their loved ones do. Um, and remember that at this time in COVID, um, substance abuse uh, treatment uh, can take place over the phone or via virtual. They, people don't have to go in person. So we have lots of different um, avenues there. So this was a CDC report on uh, fatal drug overdoses. There was also a couple of papers that I saw on non-fatal ER visits increasing quite substantially. So um, hopefully this just kind of uh, brings your attention back uh, to what I consider to be a, a pretty significant issue going on. Um, and that, that those are all the, the only literature updates that I brought to you. And I think we have a couple minutes if Dana wants to use them to do some question and answers possibly. Uh, thank you, um, Ariel. And I am actively trying to screen through these. So I'm just going to offer to the team who has been helping uh, for this. If you're seeing any questions that you have already answered for, please uh, jump in. I'm going to just pause for a minute to allow uh, the my co-presenters to jump in if there isn't uh, as I'm looking through the questions myself. Um, we did get a question about corrections and um, in terms of priority prioritization of uh, both. I'm guessing I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to find the question. I think the question was about both inmates as well as staff. Thanks, Tanya. I um, so uh, correction staff uh, and those can be at uh, state Department of Corrections or county level. Uh, city jails, um, those staff were included in 1A. Um, <clears throat> the Vaccine Advisory Committee, um, as has been spoken to in different venues, I'm sorry we didn't speak to that in much detail today, which was established uh, several weeks ago, are uh, helping uh, Oregon to co-create kind of the vision for how future populations move forward in eligibility. Of course, uh, this week's um, federal announcement uh, moved that forward kind of before we were expecting in terms of uh, taking us to the next stage around uh, those who are 65 and older. That started as a recommendation at the federal level, um, but the Vaccine Advisory Committee was um, asked uh, to include and consider uh, the sequencing for adults in custody um, in youth in custody who are uh, over the um, the who are eligible based on age for vaccines. Uh, so they were uh, intended to be considered as part of 1B. We're still sorting through what these letters are now that we are moving forward uh, into this next stage uh, based on the prompting from the news from the federal government and the Governor Brown's announcement this week. Uh, but again, uh, currently the Vaccine Advisory Committee is in, uh, informing uh, that decision in terms of exact timing, but uh, certainly intended to be soon. 
Great, thank you. There are also questions about vaccine hesitancy and um, uh, thinking about considerations for different groups. Um, I can answer just one piece about Oregon educators. I understand that the vaccine hesitancy rate is fairly high and that that's one of the considerations in um, thinking about teachers being next is uh, working to address that. But I know that there are other um, populations with vaccine hesitancy. So I think the question is, um, how aware are we of different groups and vaccine hesitancy and um, are there efforts underway to uh, to work on that um, and improve messaging or work with groups? Uh, thank you, Tanya. So um, a little bit I, I spoke to about from the state's uh, work that is underway um, in coordination with the governor's office, there is a very substantial uh, coordinated um, communications effort forthcoming that um, is uh, going to have, I suspect, a strong visibility um, and intended to be both quite broad and specific to uh, addressing some uh, hesitancy by a particular population. So um, I, I think uh, the plan had originally be, been that this would come out a little bit later after the healthcare personnel phase, but as we are moving, I think, more quickly into the next phases of vaccination, I know they're working to turn that uh, timeline up closely, and I believe that there will be more information shared about this at tomorrow's uh, press conference with the governor. Um, so I, I think more will be announced there, more detail than I have in front of me right now. So that is part of the role of the state. Um, I know as some of our colleagues have mentioned uh, uh, in the chat box, there are a lot of um, additional tools out there with regards to vaccine hesitancy. And I'm really glad to see uh, some of the work being done through associations and others to kind of bring those uh, tools and messaging back to the forefront that will be important here uh, very much going forward. And, uh, and certainly uh, the resource that you all provide to your patients and, and colleagues in discussing this will be really uh, critical. Uh, so more information forthcoming, again, very informed by um, a large amount of research and focus groups that have been underway over these uh, past month or, or longer. I saw one question in the chat box about uh, vaccines and pregnant women. I just wanted to address that really quickly. Um, OHA doesn't actually have a position on anyone who be, should be immunized. Um, we rely on CDC and ASIP. Um, they, pregnant women are encouraged to get these vaccines. They're safe in pregnancy and there's some data that particularly in third trimester, um, there are worse outcomes for mom and baby if they get COVID. So I would encourage you or your patients if you're pregnant to consider getting the vaccine. Tanya, maybe I can just jump in. I want to make sure I try to answer it online and I'm not sure how our new technology works. So <laughs> I just want to note that there was a question about anaphylaxis and a need for more information out there about safety considerations. And um, I know the CDC has information. I'm not completely up to date on what we have on this on our own state website. We are working very hard to look at the guidance from the state. Um, in terms of understanding both in our state and with other colleagues about what's being observed with regards to uh, um, responses to the vaccine, including allergic responses and anaphylaxis. So I know that there is work underway to create such guidance for OHA or amend it, uh, if should we already have some on our website. And I we are also aware that the CDC is taking a look at this and we might be expecting updated uh, guidance here soon. Um, I think it's really in, important uh, topic uh, to pay attention to uh, both obviously from a safety and health reason and, and to um, have as much information as we can share. Um, so that can uh, for people who may be hesitant from that standpoint. So uh, I know a lot of work and process under this and we'll make sure we uh, try to get information up. But in the meantime, uh, CDC does have some information. And if any of my colleagues have additions to add to that, please do. I know we're uh, probably have just time for one more comment from a colleague and then we're um, at time. Uh, Dr. Mountner, it looks like you wanted to share the closing comments for us. Well, in this particular place, I have an ask. So the, uh, we are working to use the alert information system, immunization alert uh, information system to, uh, to share information across many organizations that we're trying to coordinate. And I know that the required number of fields is very small to decrease provider burden, but if we can increase 
the number of fields that clinical teams are inputting, at least with the zip code and then any more Medicaid ID or whatever else, but at least with the zip code, that will help us do a better job of matching across systems and making sure that the, that the information is shared as, uh, um, as optimally as possible to get vaccine to all the people who need it. So just a plea to increase our data uh, entry, acknowledging the burden on providers for that, for that alert system that really is gonna be one of the linchpins for our communication across the state with regard to who has received vaccine and who, who has not. An acknowledgement of all that you are doing for for our communities and putting yourselves at risk and your staff at risk uh, by going to going to do your job and take care of people. So thank you for doing that work and for being really clear with us about your needs so that we can do our best to meet them. We will go ahead and follow up on the questions that we have not been able to answer during today's call and uh, and provide that information back to you in full circle. Dana. Just thank you for joining us. And as uh, Dr. Mountner said, for all of your work uh, on this slide, we've outlined kind of we'll continue these on the second Thursdays. Um, and there are also Project Echo, uh, uh, these next phase of the Project Echo for clinicians on the first and third Thursdays. As always, stay uh, tuned to our website where we're updating information regularly. And um, thank you and be safe. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you.